Um, this project, uh, the Tate Thames Dig, which coming on London's foreshore, will be on display uh, at the Tate um, in a little over uh, about a week's time. Um, Mark worked alongside a team of volunteers, uh, sifting through and collecting, examining, and classifying a diverse range of objects that have kicked around on the muddy foreshores for decades, if not centuries. And um, you can go and see it yourself in a week's time. Um, this process of collecting, examining, and classifying is, is central, uh, really, to, uh, to Mark's work, um, which is often which is often indeed a, a critique of those same processes as used by institutions all over the world to define certain aspects of our culture, specifically uh, with this work uh, in relation to nature and history, biology and, and ecology. Uh, his work often uh, exposes what we think of as knowledge as a uh, little more than uh, dubious speculations. Um, in undermining this, the veracity or at least the neutrality of, of scientific knowledge, there's also an analogy, I, I suppose, to the same processes of uh, of, uh, of, of collecting and processing in, in, in uh, art production, in art exhibiting, uh, and in collecting. In this respect, Mark's work could, could be seen to continue the critique of the institutions, the, the museums, and the mechanisms which classify not only science, but, uh, but also our understanding of art. Anyway, um, Mark will speak for uh, about an hour, and then I hope there'll be some questions for the floor. Um, I think it's quite uh, a very good timing, actually, to have uh, Mark here and for the project uh, at the Tate, because at the, at the moment, I don't know if you know, we have a, a TV program walking with the, with the dinosaurs, which is possibly the, the most popular uh, TV program, uh, science-related TV program in Britain, uh, and at the same time, it is completely, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about the science being actually quite wrong, a lot of the information being wrong, but it's presented very well, and we have 18 million viewers, so I think it's quite a contemporary, contemporary thing. Anyway, um, I, I'd like you all to uh, uh, welcome Mark uh, this evening to the AA. Thank you very much. I, I really want to um, give a special thanks to Andrew McKenzie, who's been uh, the most patient and persistent, and uh, he, re he really has tracked me all over, and, and I'm very glad that he, um, that he was persistent, and, and thanks a lot. I, I appreciate it. I'm very ha happy to be here tonight. So what, what I thought I would do is, um, uh, you know, I've lectured in the last five years quite a bit in, in London, and I've done a lot of different lectures. Uh, and one lecture I have never done is to just go through my slides and talk about what I do without um, putting on a, a, a layer of fat, uh, you know, sort of trying to contextualize it in terms of, of natural historical practices or, or um, in terms of the uh, history of science. So what I'm going to do is just show you my work, talk about it, try to describe some of the projects. Uh, and I'm going to start off with one carousel of, of um, classics and then one carousel of very, very fresh new pieces. So um, can we have the lights? So I, I want to begin um, deep in the jungles of Venezuela, actually, in the Amazonas territory. Uh, and this is in 1992. So an important part of, of the work I do, I think, is, is um, I don't really want to call it site-specific because that, that means something very particular to me, but it's, it has a relationship to a site. It's site-sensitive. Uh, and that site is not just the place uh, and not just the architectural conditions under which the work is exhibited, but it also, you know, there's also a temporal site when, when things are made. And that's something that, as a piece gets older, I think that an aspect of that, I mean, for me, a piece that is site-specific, that has another life, always exists as an interesting art, art, artifact and artwork. And so something like this has, has as a temporal, I mean, an example of that would be that this is done in 1992 when there was a lot of discussion and a lot of um, uh, problems being c uh, about 1492 being discussed. And that, that was sort of culturally very current in some way, especially in South America. Uh, so during, uh, during this project, I was working for two museums in Venezuela, and uh, our agreement was that they would send me into a very remote area of, um, of the Amazonas territory, and for a period of four weeks, I would uh, travel there. I was, I was traveling with the Peroa Indians, and each week I would collect a box of materials and send it back to the museum. So the museum started off 
uh, uh, each museum with four empty tables. Uh, then these boxes would arrive, I would hope, because they would have to go through a very complicated system of travel. They would have to go um, from a dugout to a speedboat to an airplane or a helicopter to a truck into the museum, and in which time I, I had no contact once they left my hands, so I didn't really know if they would arrive. Now, I, I was collecting things that, for me, illustrated um, um, jungle ecology in some way. Uh, they, they had really particular kinds of ideas about, I had very good ideas about how things should go together, what kinds of relationships they had based on relationships I witnessed uh, in nature, but how things would actually wind up in the, in the museum once they started opening these boxes, I didn't really know. So something that might be a very considered argument, oops, let's see, is that forward? There we go might just end up like this, quite a mess, actually, because there are no instructions. So what they're, o they're opening these boxes and just finding raw materials. So it's a little bit like imagining taking a natural history museum, shuffling it like this, and then presenting it to someone and say, we'll put it back together again. So sometimes they would organize things based on uh, how, how museums very often organize things, formal principles rather than any principles that I had. And then this is the final box, and this is what the, what the um, tables look like, more or less. So you see the box there, and then the final box, I sent back my materials, what I brought into the, into the bush with me. Now this is the piece probably about eight years later, and um, another aspect of the temporal context in this case is that I've taken that work and uh, there's been a lot of criticism about how um, institutional critique is becoming institutionalized. And a lot of the people who, um, who I sort of came up with from a critical background are now reassessing what happens when you take institutional critique artists and they become the official artists. So, um, I wanted to just um, let them know how institutionalized we can actually really become and to institutionalize my own work in some way, to really make it, um, um, uh, I think, very flat and, and I think in a very ironic way. So to present, present, in some case, try to historicize that project, but also to be ironic about it. I want to show these, especially the works in this group, because they, they, do, um, they do demonstrate a performative aspect. I mean, I don't think of myself as a, as a performance artist, and when I do works that do have an active element, I, I try n I'm never pretending to be someone else. Um, I'm never pretending to be a scientist. I'm not a scientist. Um, although I'm borrowing methodologies, I'm always marked eye on the artist working as a scientist, not a scientist, or uh, not, not, I'm not trying to present myself that way. So while I was working also on another project in Brazil, I was asked by a Museum of Natural History in Switzerland to do a project, and obviously you can't be in Brazil and Switzerland at the same time. So what I asked them to do is, is, to, take, is to make a vitrine and to leave it completely empty. And what I would do is while I was traveling, um, I would watch for um, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, mammals, all of the vertebrates, and I would make lists of ones that I could positively identify. I would send them the lists, and then they would display those lists with the animals that were in their collection. I'm very interested in, in, the, su in the subjective aspects of the collection. I see the Natural History Museum as a kind of weird Noah's Ark, and the ideal museum has two good examples of everything. But there's a lot of things that frustrate that ideal. One thing being that um, maybe a particular scientist is interested in a particular kind of spider. So you have 20,000 examples of that, but then there might be other spiders you have none, no examples of. That's just not his field. Or, um, or, you know, there are real pragmatic things. If it rains when they visit a certain island, they have a less representative collection while they're, while they're collecting. So I'm always trying to do things that, that in some way not just talk about what is in the museum, but talk about how it got there. So in this case, you'll see that um, there's the list I sent them, and this is the bird that they had from that list, the um, tropical kingbird. And in this case, they had two birds. 
So I'm interested in trying to point out, you know, uh, how incomplete that is. This work continues um, this project because some years later, two of these boxes actually miraculously somehow make it to the United States. And they're filled with um, all of the stuff that I collected in Venezuela. But now, of course, it's, it's a couple years old and it's, it's going through different stages of decay and it's traveled, so things have been broken and jumbled. And uh, I put it in an exhibition in which I have three fictional bureaucracies. Uh, and the business of those bureaucracies is to organize nature. And they have, the, they have their own temperament, they have their own style, they have their own focus, uh, and they have their own uh, methodology. So in this case, this is the New York, uh, New York State Bureau of Tropical Conservation. I'm using conservation not in the terms of wildlife conservation, but in the terms of sort of art conservation. So every twig, every branch, every butterfly, every fish and formalin, every element in those boxes is taken out, carefully cataloged, um, wrapped in glassine, acid-free paper, bubble wrap, plastic, numbered and put onto a shelf. Now these fictional bureaucracies are active during the exhibition. So if you come to this exhibition, there I am. I'm working at one of these three. So if you come early in the morning, I'm working at, um, there's sort of a hippie one called the Upper West Side Plant Project, which is a kind of very feel-good one, in which I have a nice green apron. And it's, it's about um, organizing um, plant material in a way, a plant material that comes from an expedition to the Upper West Side uh, grocery stores, in which I collect every fresh plant. Every, and so I'm, I'm preserving them, I'm pickling them, I'm drying them. Uh, and then there's this one, in which it, it is a very, very serious sort of archival practice. So there I am. Uh, of course, everything is packed in carefully with uh, insect insecticide, um, carefully labeled, numbered, placed on the shelf. This is sort of midway through, in which one of the boxes is finished, but the other still needs to be processed. And then this is the final piece. So for me, in, in this case, this is what I would consider the final sculptural work in some sense, that um, what I've done as an artist is constitute a collection. And that collection exists, um, it can be retrieved, um, it can be look, looked into, um, and there are these doors that were set at the front of the exhibition, and those kind of give you a clue to what kind of organization it is, what kind of temperament the organization might have. Um, this is one of the other organizations, and uh, this is called the New York State Bureau, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's the um, Department of Marine Animal Identification of the City of New York, the Chinatown Division. <laughs> How could I have ever made a mistake? So like I said, all of these were based on, on a, an expedition. Sometimes that expedition wasn't to exotic tropical places. That expedition in this case was just four blocks away to New York City's Chinatown, in which for a period of about four hours, um, I went through collecting as many fresh sea creatures as I could possibly lay my hands on. Those were then put on ice, uh, brought into the gallery, and here they are. This is, this, is, uh, this is, again, this is how the project begins. We have the resource, we have the materials, and we have the cabinet. Um, and in this case, what the job of, of, of this character was, was to take every fish and to um, key it out to go through the process of, of um, official orthodox taxonomy and to find its, its real name and its place in, um, in, a, in a natural history order. And it's actually not easy because there, there are a lot of uh, fish species which are very, very similar. And so in some cases you can only tell the difference between the species by you know, how many scales it has on its lateral line and you, start, you have to count scales. And of course, the fish are, um, are getting compromised by time. And uh, <laughs> so it, it's all, I mean, one of the aspects of this project is that you enter into a situation in which you see, um, you see that I'm losing, um, I'm losing my grip on the mastery of the situation. I'm not entirely in control. Uh, that uh, sometimes I'm, I'm very much working over my head and I'm trying, I'm running very fast to try to stay in the same place and that's an important aspect of, of, of these projects and it's an important part of, of this, what I think is a difficult relationship between whether, how, how it functions in terms of performance. So this would be a finished specimen. 
And then this would be the finished work, the Department of Marine Animal Identification of the City of New York, the Chinatown Division. I'm very interested in uh, in the tropics because I, I, mean I have a, a very uh, I have a personal passion and a lot of I mean all of my work really comes out of um, uh, a real intense personal interest and that's I don't know how someone could make really interesting art if they didn't care about these things very strongly. Um, one of the one of the characters I'm very interested in is a person named William Beebe who was sort of the, what, the Jacques Cousteau or the David Attenborough of the early part of the century. He was an American ornithologist. He was a great popularizer of, of natural history issues. He wrote 14 books that were all bestsellers. He did radio interviews. He, he was sort of a well-known figure uh, in culture. He was also sort of New York sophisticate as well. And uh, he was very interesting because he was one of the first people to say, well, if you really want to study life, it's probably better to go where life is than to study dead specimens in the basement of a museum. And so he started the first tropical research stations in, uh, in what was then British Guyana. Uh, and, uh, and he established field stations with scientists and artists in situ working on studying the, li the life of these animals rather than describing dead specimens. Um, and he wrote extensively about that. On his way back, he'd been in Guyana. He established the first one, he, he, uh, his first field station. He lived there for three years. On his way back home, um, he decided he would sit in front of one giant tree, uh, and he sat there for the entire week in Belém, which is at the mouth of the Amazon, waiting for his steamer ship. And he observed all of the, all of the animals um, that came to this tree, which was fruiting. And of course, he shot them, because he was still in that 19th century tradition. Uh, and then just before the steamer's leaving, he measures out a square meter of leaf litter, and he removes it. He puts that into his duffel bag, and then on his way back to New York, he starts to sift through it, and he is discovering that there are tens of thousands of animals living in this, in this meter, and that uh, these are the microfauna that essentially run the, run, run the earth. You know, uh, trips and pseudoscorpions and um, uh, springtails and all sorts of things like that. Um, and in some way, it's one of the early indications that really if we're talking about biological diversity, we're really talking about what's going on in, the, in this tropical region. Um, another great story of his is, it was called My Jungle Table, in which he had a table constructed um, while he was working in the jungle. And on that table, he was doing his dissections, uh, and he was looking at his specimens. And uh, in order to do that, you need to put the legs of the table in coffee cans of water so the ants don't climb up the legs and eat all your specimens, which they will do. Uh, so while he did that, suddenly his table began to sprout and grow, and it was growing and growing. And then spiders began spinning webs across it. And then he could hear the wood-boring beetles sort of ticking inside of it to each other. So while he's trying to describe, while he's trying to isolate a system, a system sort of taking over around him. So these two stories really inspired me, uh, and uh, I was very interested in, in the dialogue going on uh, about biodiversity during the Rio Earth Summit. Uh, and this, this was done for the Earth Summit at the, at the Museum of Modern Art in Rio. Uh, so I was going through this process for the first 10 days of um, sorting, sorting through and uh, removing all of these microinvertebrates. So I had large resource, which I removed pretty much from the same forest he did, which is there's still one intact um, um, area in Berlin, which is part of the um, Gaudi Institute. Now, of course, the, I mean, one of the interesting things is that the art audience in uh, Rio is a very active audience. It doesn't have kind of sanctified space like we normally experience it. So, uh, so people really do get involved when you encourage them to get involved. Sometimes they really, really get involved, and so it's, it can even be hard to get things done. Uh, this is a project I did uh, for the exhibition called Sonspec, which was in 1993. And Sonspec is, is a, um, a large site-specific exhibition that happens in the city of Arnhem in the Netherlands. Um, and I was very interested in this one institution that existed on the border of the city. And it's, it's a bizarre place because it, it's called Brombeck. And it's a museum of colonial history. It's a museum of military history. It's a sort of museum of, of natural history curiosities, and it's a retirement home for colonial soldiers. 
So if you imagine it sort of shaped like a U, the bottom of the U is the museum, and then the two vertical parts actually are where these guys live. So if you happen to stumble into this museum unsuspected, you, you are confronted with these veterans who will grab you by the arm and take you through every exhibit in the museum and tell you every war story you never wanted to hear. So I, I'm very interested in the way this museum comes about because what happens is uh, for the last century and a half, when these guys pass on, uh, the museum people go through their stuff and if something is museum worthy, it goes on the wall. And if something isn't, it goes in the dumpster. Uh, this, is, these, this is an illustration of what, how the museum was installed in the, in the 19th century. And it was much more like, uh, it, was, it was quite reminiscent of the very early Dutch collections, of, of uh, curiosity cabinet collections. Uh, things jumbled together, uh, decontextualized, uh, uh, space and time conflated somehow. So what I did was I reestablished one of these cabinets as close as possible to the original. In fact, with a lot of the same, same objects that were in the original cabinet. And then the, I made a second cabinet and asked the men who, um, who lived there if they wouldn't give me one of their objects now while they're still alive and um, if they wouldn't also include the narrative of that object. Not just, not just this thing, but how did it get there? And um, the way we, we did this is we actually made a television program about it. So they brought the, brought the objects and placed them in the case and we just had this incredibly uh, uh, sophisticated collection of things that were, were just, the meanings were really complex. Like this number, uh, the letter N was a coffee can. A lot of these guys were interred during the Second World War uh, and it, it really was the most profound um, experience of their lives. They, they lost their families and uh, there's still uh, many of them suffering very, very heavily from, the, from that kind of tragedy. Um, so N was a coffee can that they had on the prisoners knew about this can. And um, it was a kind of conspiracy that they had against their, um, against their captors, against their oppressors. So everyone, despite the fact that they were starving and they were put in the slave labor camps uh, and they were routinely questioned, no one would give up the coffee can conspiracy. So no matter how hard they were hit, they always had this kind of coffee can. And here it was 50 years later, still unopened, still intact, still uh, a sort of emblem of their resistance somehow. Uh, and then this, uh, the book that's there is, is a recipe book. So of course, um, people are starving in prisoner of war camp. Uh, and you have recipes of all of the people who were in the war camp. So there are recipes from Australia, from Britain, from Holland. Uh, there are Malaysian recipes. There are Dutch recipes. There are, uh, you know, all of this uh, uh, Japanese recipes, they're all encapsulated in this book. So uh, it, it was, it's just kind of amazing to see how these, how these objects, when you, when you gave them back their um, subjective histories, how they resonated. You know, there was a spoon that um, we had to convince this guy to give up the spoon that he'd been eating with since, uh, you know, since 1940, which had now become so sharp from, from eating that it was actually cutting him and uh, you know and then you have things like this sort of kitsch um, uh, uh, wood carving which you know seems like it certainly wouldn't make it into the museum it really has no intrinsic kind of importance but then you find out that this guy took this from the bedstand of his mistress on the last night they were together and he couldn't tell her that uh, he was shipping off the next day and he just sort of took that as an emblem and still had it so I'm in this case, I, I'm really trying to emphasize, and, and I think the project really did emphasize, this, this kind of lost history. This is the town of, of Fribourg in Switzerland, uh, and this is um, a set of houses that, uh, the other side of these houses is, is really the town square. And this side uh, faces a gully. And since the 16th century, when these houses were built, or some of them were built, um, People have been doing what people do in cities all over the world. They were throwing garbage out the window, or things were falling out the window occasionally. So we removed a healthy amount of this material from below the window, brought it into um, the museum, and then carefully started to go through it, removing every object one piece at a time. Uh, we built a series of, uh, uh, we built a very long shelf and started with, along the wall, started cleaning the things, numbering them, placing them on the shelf, starting with number one. 
and placing them pretty much as we found them. So there was no, um, uh, certainly no kind of chronological order, no relationship in terms of material. Just this is the first thing I found, this is the first thing I cleaned, first thing I numbered, it goes first on the shelf. The second piece goes second, and so on. You know, so I'm obviously I'm very interested in, in the kind of impression you have from, from a city in Fribourg, or a city, a city like Fribourg, where you have this simultaneity of history, where you have um, the 16th century house uh, next to a 19th century uh, uh, construction, which has just opened a new McDonald's in the basement. And, you know, all of that kind of feeling is always something that's really Im impressive to me. That was the upstairs gallery. The downstairs gallery, and this was an exhibition called Unseen Freeboard. Uh, the downstairs gallery, I built a laboratory. And in that laboratory, I, I, I utilized BV's method of, of taking the um, meter of, of forest, and this time I took a meter of, of alpine meadow. I brought that into my laboratory, and there I worked on it um, with, a, with a photographer, and we removed as many of the little critters as we could get. And we had a 100 foot long wall um, in front of us, and we started with photo number one of specimen number one, and went until we had um, exhausted ourselves and the uh, budget of the museum. So, I mean, this is just sort of a random sample of some of the things we found. This is an another um, insect related project. This is called the Great Munich Bug Hunt. And I worked with the um, Zoological Institute in Munich, who had some uh, very eager graduate students. We found a, a, a dead linden tree outside the Black Forest and um, brought it into the gallery. It had been dead about five years. And we then began to do almost a kind of autopsy on the tree, uh, removing all of the things that had, that had um, uh, at one time a parasitic relationship to the tree and now a sort of equaline relationship to the tree. So we just stripped it all out, prepared the things in our makeshift laboratory, and finally um, presented them in a modified cabinet. So this is, at, this is really at the very beginning of the project. And by the end, we, of course, had hundreds of thousands um, of specimens, I mean, quite literally. Uh, this is a project called Curiosity's Cabinet for the Wexner Center of the Arts. I think everything um, showing probably from now on is, is, is newer work than most people will have, will have seen, I hope, anyway. Uh, the Wexner Center for the Arts is part of the um, Ohio State University, which is one of the world's largest universities. I mean, it's just obscenely large. Uh, you can drive you know, for an hour and still come across the Air and Space Campus or the Veterinary Medicine Campus or, it's, it's just gigantic. It's in Columbus, Ohio. And, um, I mean, it, it, it's a very interesting sort of late enlightenment institution and uh, like a lot of institutions, uh, it has acquired collections. Some of these collections are very formalized, like it has a Museum of, of Geology, for example, and it has a celebrity eyeglass collection, for example. And then there are other collections that just sort of happened. You know, this, uh, a microscope got old enough that you couldn't throw it in the dumpster. So um, I, I decided that I would try to take um, a kind of Wunderkammer sensibility, uh, take this, this method of, of, of the microcosm, as the university is somehow an attempt to be a microcosm, and reimpose it uh, with the collections, sort of shuffle them around a little bit, and maybe use pre-enlightenment categories, maybe uh, Aristotelian categories for the arrangement. So you enter through one of these two doors. Notice how wheelchair accessible it is. And then you're on, can we get focus on that? Then you're on a sort of raised platform, which is raised about a meter above the ground. And uh, you're looking across, uh, across a gulf at, at a microcosm, a miniature, diminutive representation of the world, at least as I see it. And um, all of these were collected in 
probably about 24 different departments or different um, sections of the school to um, represent um, the underworld, um, the uh, aquatic realm, the realm of the air, the terrestrial realm, humankind, the library and the archive. I mean, just in this cabinet alone, it's, it's very heavily um, curated in, man, in many ways. Uh, all of the books are carefully selected from probably about 12 different libraries. The allegory of vision. There are some celebrity eyeglasses there, including Joan Collins, um, George Bush, and Colonel Sanders. Um, sound and music, I mean sound and time, rather. And the allegory of history. I, I am very interested in, in sort of um, the Enlightenment and sort of pre-Enlightenment ideas and, and the way that um, museums are put together. I, I like to sort of trace things back to this time and imagine other roads that could have been taken. Um, and also think how different things are. So I was very interested in, in public anatomies and public anatomies were done a lot in the 17th and 18th century and they were normally done, especially in, in the Netherlands, around the, this time of year actually, the beginning of, um, the beginning of winter and they have very interesting um, architectural forms. Uh, they were done in the marketplace and they were very popular. They were always, uh, they were done by someone who was a little bit sort of proto-doctor, a little bit charlatan, a little bit showman. They had uh, very elaborate costumes that they would wear and they would dissect these criminals uh, very often, surprisingly finding that uh, you could detect their criminality by the size of their liver or, or by defects within their hearts or any, any number of things like this. Um, and so, uh, and of course these, these sort of things, uh, this is the one, this is the anatomy theater in Padua where you'd actually s stand and look down and the closer you were uh, to the table, the closer uh, you were to uh, graduating with your degree. Uh, so. And of course, eventually, um, I mean, a very interesting thing is if you go back to that other slide, you see that there are men and women there together, uh, which is sort of unimaginable. I'm very interested in how in the 18th century you have, there's sort of so many uh, interesting enlightenment ideas in place that then get crushed in the 19th century. So it's certainly unimaginable to have a woman present at an, at an anatomy lesson in the 19th century. Uh, so then, of course, the body goes into the um, goes into the academy, and um, and becomes uh, becomes something that is subject to um, to privatize to to uh, special a realm of specialized interest. So uh, I found out that in in um, in the Netherlands, uh, I'm sure you all know the painting of the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tolp by Rembrandt, and that that is actually still that room is still available for use, you can rent that room. And so I decided I would rent that room and give an anatomy lesson or, or I would construct an anatomy lesson with two professors. And it was always done with two people. So you had uh, someone, who was dem someone who was speaking and someone who was actually cutting. So we printed tickets and made posters and uh, presented uh, the anatomy of a goat. Uh, and we had the perfect ham professor who was absolutely genius about this. I think we had roughly about 35 people, which is it's not that great, but the room's quite small and very hot. Uh, this is a project um, called the Skohari Creek Field Station, and it's a collaboration um, with two people who I work with very often, uh, J. Morgan Pewitt, who's an artist and a um, fashion designer, and uh, Rob, Robert Brain, Bob Brain, who's a photographer. and. Uh, working on a site in upstate New York, um, uh, uh, Lexington, New York, I believe it is, on the Schoharie Creek. Uh, we decided that we, we sort of relocated this um, building uh, 
a very, very small, what had been at one time a chicken coop and then was a uh, dressing room for a theater company. And now we thought we would uh, redress it again uh, and make it into a kind of monument to, uh, um, to a certain tradition of, of American nature writing, uh, namely that of, of, of Muir, Burroughs, and, uh, uh, and to a certain extent Thoreau. So it more or less had the, had the proportions of Thoreau's cabin. And the idea is that we also filled it with a lot of contemporary material as well as trying to recapitulate this, this um, almost Adirondack style. And the idea is, of course, that you can, your way of, of experiencing this thing is that you write them a letter and uh, they send you the key and you can go and stay here for a week or a weekend. Unfortunately, I, I'm sorry to say, I don't think it exists anymore. Uh, and then these are some interior shots. And so we had very contemporary literature. We had uh, contemporary, you know, things like microscopes, sieves, water gauges, um, chemicals to test the quality of the river, um, all of which could be used, as well as um, um, lots of books on landscape poetry and uh, books on advice on how to go fishing and things like that. This is the city of Venice, and I, I worked uh, two years ago as a guest of the Nordic Pavilion in Venice. Um, uh, working with the city, uh, the city has to periodically uh, dredge the canals. Uh, the canals build up with garbage. It's very expensive to throw your garbage away in Venice. A and so people tend to, in the middle of the night, you might hear a big splash, could, which could be an air conditioner or a refrigerator going out the window into the canal. Eventually this builds up and causes boat hazards. And so the city has to dredge this. They take these machines, they get the junk from the canal, they bring it out to the lagoon and they throw it in. in. So uh, I visited one of these dredge sites for uh, an extended period of time and uh, moved some of this dredge. Did a three-part exhibition at, uh, at the Nordic Pavilion. This is outside the Nordic Pavilion in which we've taken um, this quite large amount of dredge out and brought it to the canal, brought it to the, uh, to the pavilion. Now, the, the dredge is so rich in cultural artifacts that you couldn't possibly stick a pencil all the way in without hitting something. I mean, it is just overflowing with things. The second part of the, of, um, the piece was a very small room uh, which was turned into a museum of, of the things that we found in the canals, this being some of it. And again, we, we found um, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of objects. Or I should say I found because it was a, a real solo project. These were um, displayed as the treasure chests. Uh, so uh, there was gems, curiosities, um, uh, uh, emeralds, uh, precious metals, and um, and ivory and pearls, otherwise Murano glass, shells, uh, glass, uh, bits of iron, and uh, porcelain. And then the final stage was a room in which you could see objects uh, in various stages of preparation. So as I was sort of cleaning and sorting the things and beginning to place them in some kind of categories. So this is, this is that room. Um, at a certain point, um, some strange men in suits arrived at the exhibition and started to put stickers on everything. And the stickers said, property of the Italian government, property of the Italian government, property of the Italian government. <laughs> and some people had, um, had uh, reported that there were, in fact, important archaeological finds within this piece. And so there is a law in the Italian government that says anything found on Italian soil it belongs to... Italy. So uh, the piece was somehow impounded, in which case we had to start, my gallery and I had to start negotiating how do we get this thing back or do we get it back or what happens to it. Uh, and uh, curiously, that, that we'd found a lot of um, very early Islamic pottery. So, so porce pottery that sort of traced in some way the, um, uh, uh, the beginnings of, of Islamic influence into Europe through Venice. Uh, and Venice is, is you know, sort of actually not that old of a city, but uh, 
that was sort of what they found to be really important. Needless to say, if we hadn't stopped this stuff, it would have just ended up in the bottom of Lagoon, like the other 40 boats a day do. But um, so they uh, so they wanted to take the piece after after my gallery tried to discuss with them my work and the kind of sens sensibility I have. Uh, they decided, well, in fact, we want the piece. We want some pieces, but we'd rather could we just have them as artworks instead of having just the artifacts? And so, in the end, we made a, a very classic Italian. Uh, they made they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I had to give half of the exhibition to them, and I could keep the other half essentially. And the dredge is ex is exactly what you imagine it to be. It is as bad. Uh, uh, and it was uh, extremely difficult to work for a period of time uh, uh, under under those sort of conditions. Okay, I think that's it for that carousel. Let me go on. I think what I'm going to do is, is show this next carousel. I think is is mostly pretty fresh work. Oops, wrong way. Okay, this is a um, piece called the Grot Grotto for the Sleeping Bear, and it was done for the sculpture project in Munster. And Munster is is a, uh, incredibly um, uh, civilized and and uh, peaceful town in in Germany, which every ten years hosts the sculpture project, which I think is one of the most successful um, public art endeavors. Um, I was I was asked to go very late. Uh, I was I was sort of one of the last people invited. And it didn't give me a lot of time to do the kind of research that sometimes my work requi requires. But I, I was still very interested in doing something there. Uh, I was interested in, in looking for <coughs> what does what does wilderness mean in a place like this? What's wild? And now, Munster, of course, is a place that hasn't had something that you could call wilderness since the year 800. I mean, it's it's really been uh, settled and culturally developed for ages and ages and ages. Um, and uh, I found this kind of interesting little park in Munster, which is, is in West Valley, which is a very flat region. For some reason, this park had a lot of hills. And what, what actually, Munster was about 86% destroyed during the Second World War. And all of the rubble was put in this one area. And then dirt covered it. And then it became this uh, hilly park. So I was, I was really interested in that kind of strange history. And also that this park ha existed it was a very unkempt park and also existed as a kind of wild space for a number of reasons because there was a lot of drug activity that went on there at night and there was a lot of cruising and a lot of prostitution. Uh, so it became, you know, it was wild in other ways in some way. And then also you had this sort of statue of the Brothers Grimm and you had this strange um, playground. So you had kind of all of this ingredients of German folklore somehow. Um, I was very interested in in, uh, in in creating an outdoor diorama. So this is uh, this is my bear, who sleeps in a cave, which had um, had it not been for um, some very imposing signs saying "artwork this way" <laughs> kind of thing, would have been something that you could come across in, in a very kind of casual and sort of interesting way. Um, the bear is surrounded by a number of of items. That in fact, there's quite a few items that uh, talk a little bit about the history of, of the relationship of nature in the region. These, these are a few of the things that are in the cave. A year later, I was asked to go back and do, and, um, do another project. Uh, I was asked to go back this time by the Paleontology Museum. Very often, I, I'm asked to do projects by natural history museums, which is always an interesting challenge for me. Uh, so I wanted to do, well, this is called The Grotto of the Sleeping Bear Revisited. And I wanted to do a piece that was somehow a comment on what happens when you take public site-specific work and institutionalize it in some way. This is always sort of a problem for me, because I'm not, 
the idea of just doing something and, and it exists for a short period of time and then it evaporates is, is a really unsatisfying one in some way. Um, so I want to be able to, to keep, things, keep things rolling, keep expanding projects. I think by now you probably see that a lot of my projects snowball into other projects uh, and they sort of spin off into other projects like 1970s sitcoms or something. So this, this one is actually uh, the skeleton of a cave bear and a cave bear is at least one third larger than my very, very small brown bear. And she's surrounded by a lot of the same objects. Um, but now she is, now, now she is within a museum. And, she, and there is always something that's lost when you move a project like this to a museum. Very, I really, of course, am very also very interested in this. This work is in a very strange situation because it's not at all signed. So people come into the museum, and, and the museum is a very small museum of paleontology. So it's most likely only people from Munster who would see it, who of course have seen the project, and there would always be this kind of reminiscent back back and forth between the original outdoors outdoor work and this work, and I think it. it, it would be very difficult for them to find out uh, that this is actually by the same artist rather than something that I might have cited as my original source material. The bear from Munster, I mean like a lot of public work, uh, there's always problems with vandalism and uh, uh, Munster had a lot of problems with vandalism. I had um, not so much vicious vandals but I had very clever funny vandals. So. Um, the first thing they did was they unscrewed the glass that made the work a diorama and they removed the bear. They walked her down several blocks to the lake and they threw her in. So then we got her back and we blow dried it and put it under heat lamps and got it reasonably dry, put her back in the cave and then someone came back and unscrewed the glass again and then they removed all the objects. So we're talking about probably 15 pretty difficult to find things. So all of the people who worked for the, for the Munster Project had to go start going to flea markets and secondhand shops trying to reconstitute this collection of objects. Then they found, once they started to uh, gather these things up, that someone had actually gone and put them back exactly where they were before. So then just the last day of the exhibition, the bear disappeared completely and was found two weeks later uh, under an underpass uh, in Bavaria, you know. <laughs> so, so the bear has traveled a lot, and I'm very interested in thinking about her sort of keep, keeping moving. And so again, this is, this is something I, I'm very interested in thinking about. What is the difference? What, what happens when you have to move things around? What happens to, can you have a work of art built for a context that carries its context with it somehow? This selection of slides seems to be very heavy in the um, in Germany, but that's just sort of the way it, the way it happened. This is a, a piece for an exhibition called "I Love New York," which I think was not a very in, it's not a very interesting idea for me. To I'm not really interested in, in exhibitions that are about New York <coughs> artists or American artists or British artists. I find that whole um, regional nationalistic trend to be really regressive. So I wanted to do a piece that in some way was, was very um, uh, confrontational to that. Uh, I'm very interested, obviously really interested in the history of the representation of nature. I mean, that's really my main thematic somehow. And mostly I work with those official institutions, scientific institutions, but of course there's another tradition entirely, which is this entertainment tradition, which comes very, very close together um, with a figure like P.T. Barnum, for example, who was a great American show, showman uh, who did, um, um, I mean, of course, he's most famous for his, his circuses, which somehow still exist, but also he was the founder of the first very, very large mu museums, the American Museum, in which there were several of them that um, burnt down, which were largely museums of, um, of natural history objects, curiosities, they had entertainment shows, and they had um, humbugs. And uh, P.T. Barnum was the genius of humbug, and I think in many ways 
Uh, he's really a prototype for a lot of contemporary artists. He's certainly a prototype for people like Warhol, for people like Coons. One of my favorite humbugs is um, he advertised uh, the most ferocious uh, uh, man-eating chicken. And so you think, oh, man-eating chicken, I really got to see that. So you pay your five cents, and of course you go behind the curtain, and there is a man-eating chicken. So, and, and Barnum is really very clever in that he was the one of the first people to articulate the idea that um, you know, the public didn't mind <laughs> being deceived as long as at the same time they were being amused. So this is sort of, a lot of my works really are, um, I know they're, they're, they're homages or, or meditations on, on different figures in, in the history of, of, of thinking about nature, and certainly he's one of them. So uh, in this case, I tried to do a Barnum-esque uh, um, exhibition within the exhibition, uh, which of course was the terror of Transylvania, the amazing zoological wonder, living fossil from the deepest forests. And you have a, a tent with a curtain, sells tickets, and a lovely broadsheet, uh, which says it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to view the first specimen of its kind ever to be exhibited each day, each week, excluding Mondays, of course. The amazing zoological wonder, the terror of Transylvania, living fossil from the deepest forests. Splendid specimen remains unclassified by modern science. The terror of Transylvania may be the source of the werewolf of legend, or it may be a prehistoric beast somehow saved from extinction. Whatever it may be, it certainly is a wonder worthy the attention of every educated and scientific person as well as the merely curious. And this is the amazing zoological wonder, which it doesn't take people very long to realize that it's a bare skull on a cow body. So, I, I mean, I really, of course, do appreciate that building up of expectations, and then you sort of let people down, but you let them down with a wink, like, oh, I know you're too smart to fall for this, which is really what that whole exhibition was about in some way. Um, this is the, f uh, the York Fields Club, which was a club of um, geologists and um, zoologists and botanists who in the early part of this century would travel to outside of the city um, uh, and collect specimens, discourse on nature, and um, uh, I imagine have a jolly time. Uh, in the 19th century, there were a lot of field clubs, and they were places, they were you know, natural history, of course, was, was a mania, and uh, nature was, was very seriously domesticated as decoration. Uh, there, were, there was a, a lot of scandal around the field clubs, primarily because um, they allowed men and women to you know, be out in nature in a less than perfectly chaperoned <coughs> environment, and some people thought that this was really foolhardy. Uh, so there were a lot of, a lot of people wrote against the uh, ladies' field clubs. Uh, so, uh, working again with J. Morgan Pewitt, we um, did some serious research about a uh, ladies' field club that existed in York, in Eng uh, uh, yeah, and uh, and they were very special because they took a, a train car out into the field and would collect. So we reconstituted their train car as much as we could. This is at the National Railway Museum. As many of these are their artifacts as we could possibly find. And then, of course, we have the women themselves. Mrs. Ian Toder, the lapidopterist, the founder of the club. Miss Mary Buckmore, the paleontologist. Edith Huntington, the geologist. Arabella Bell, the conchologist. That's obviously the study of shells. The ornithologist, Henrietta Swanson. Miss Amelia West, the botanist. Mrs. Herbert Fowler, the anthropologist. A very severe woman indeed. 
and their trustworthy porter, um, Mr. R. Cornelius Boggett. Um, this is a project, um, I'm, I'm ver I, I just did this project in San Francisco a little while ago and I was very interested in the way a city like San Francisco, um, which uh, has, a, has a very, I would say, very extreme relationship to nature in some sense. I've never been in a city where nature is sort of more battled for, um, where there are more people thinking about it, discoursing about it, researching it, policing <coughs> it. Um, it's, a very c it's something that is uh, sort of endlessly controlled. Uh, so in, during the, in this exhibition, you had a, a sort of cube within the cube, and each wall of the cube represented one of the different organizations that might have something to do with the San Francisco environment. For instance, this is the San Francisco Bay Authority <coughs> Plankton Research Station, and there's a lecture in process, so you can't enter the room. However, if you look through the window, you will see some of the most fantastical animals um, swimming by in full technicolor on, on the wall, and at the same time, you will listen to one of the most deadly dull lectures you could possibly <coughs> hear about these organisms and about their life cycles. And uh, so the mixture of these uh, sort of surrealistic animals with this fantastical body architecture and the way of describing them is greatly at odds. This is a very sad institution. It's the uh, National Botanical Survey, the Coastal Collection, um, which was shut down in the early 80s, I'm afraid. And uh, it was shut down because there was no longer money to do research on things as banal as uh, marine algaes and seaweeds. So here's the, ram the, the last elements of its collection, which includes about 500 specimens of, of seaweed, all carefully preserved. This is the American Acclimatization Society, uh, in which uh, Eugene Shifflin is the director. And this was an really a 19th century institution. And uh, Mr. Shifflin was a, a wealthy drug manufacturer, and he had two great passions. Uh, one was the works of Shakespeare. He was a huge bard fan. And the other was ornithology. He was a big birder. And he believed that um, uh, America would never amount to much unless it had all of the birds that were found in the uh, sonnets and plays of Shakespeare. So he developed the society so he could introduce American birds. Uh, so in the late 1880s, he, re he released 40 pairs of starlings into uh, New York City's um, uh, Central Park. And then the following year, he did the same. And within 100 years, the starling had reached um, Alaska and Mexico City and is now by far the most numerous um, individual bird in, in the United States. These are some of this society's achievements. And this is the Department of Marine Animal Identification of the City of San Francisco, the Chinatown Division. which revisits uh, an earlier project. I, I mean, uh, one of the things that's always interesting is that in the, in the art world, you have, you're always tied by these two weird things that go on. On one hand, there is um, a desire for a recognition, a sort of signature style. On the other, there's a desire for constant novelty. And so you always have to sort of balance these things out. Like, how do you, uh, uh, how do you, uh, continue to do your work and at the same time provide something new every time. Uh, I actually don't want to talk too much about this one. Es essentially, what uh, this is something that was done for Cranbrook Academy, um, and uh, the Cranbrook Academy is it, it's a it's a really complicated place actually, uh, but uh, they have a, a, an art museum and they have a science museum. The science museum has been closed for. Um, construction of Stephen Hall's new uh, extension. They were really eager to do something with their collection, so I asked them to give me their reptiles and amphibians. Oops. Uh, 
Um, this is a, a weird little castle outside of Munster. And Munster, I was talking a little bit about the sculpture project, and I seem to keep revisiting Munster, um, which is very funny considering what a, pla what a little place it is. But this, the region of Munster um, actually approached the government and the Museum of Art and said, can we have more public art? We really like it. We really want more. Can't you do more? And which is sort of unheard of. As an American, I just can't even imagine <laughs> that happening. It's, it would be like a, it, uh, yeah, it's just unimaginable. Uh, and so they, s they did a sculpture um, biennale this year where they wanted, where they made essentially seven, um, seven public um, permanent works based around three moated castles. And um, this was the castle I was the most interested in, which is a, a very weird 19th century sort of neo-Gothic castle, which is the only privately owned castle in the area. And because it's privately owned, and you know how things are, uh, you, don't, you, you need to raise money somehow to keep the grounds up and all that. So they've ha actually had to sell off a good part of it oops, to, the, uh, to a golf course. And so now you have this um, fake, uh, uh, this sort of fake medieval castle built in the 19th century with a golf course in it. So it all becomes a little bit like a kind of weird miniature golf landscape. Um, and so I did this project on the crossroads, which is very difficult to see, actually. Um, it's a very large oak tree covered with tar with a medieval torture wheel in the back. And on the oak tree, also made of tar, are 13 um, crows. And the sky's always like that, so. There's the crow point of view. This might be last. Uh, this is um, the Tate Thames Dig. And the Tate Thames Dig um, happens, I, I think about it as sort of three chapters within an appendix. The first chapter is the dig itself working with roughly about 25 volunteers who are mostly fall into one of two categories. They're either 15 to 17 uh, and, and living in Suffolk, or they're living in Suffolk and they are pensioners, essentially, over 65 years old. Um, so uh, we had two sites, one at Millbank, right under uh, MI5, and one here at Bankside, uh, right next to the power station. Each day for roughly about three hours during the extreme low tide, uh, we would do what's called in archaeology a surface find walk, where you just sort of walk and collect, and we collected every single thing we could get. Everything that struck their eye, and obviously this is what it looks like down there, there are a lot of things. So people would, um, depending on their ability, some would wander far, some would never leave um, the, the beach where they set their foot down. There's two of my rem most remarkable volunteers. There's the whole crew, including Francis Morris there, who, who has uh, There's several people who have really sharp eyes for this kind of thing, and she's definitely one of them. There's my super assistants, uh, Lenka Clayton and Naomi Beckwith. Uh, the second stage uh, was uh, we had constructed three tents on the lawn, one sort of interpretation center, and then two tents which are holding, uh, holding everything we found, essentially. Um, and uh, during each day, for normally half the day, we would do one, one site, the other half the other site. We would clean and organize and um, categorize every single thing we found. So every single thing that we found was is somehow processed. And that is a, a very public endeavor. People can come, and essentially our rule about the tape is that anyone who shows even a remote interest is allowed to pass through. So that was a lot of scrubbing. This is how things were stored sort of in the tents. 
more or less toward the end of the exhibition where we really begin to develop um, uh, these sort of very clear categories. Um, that's Rob Williams, who's a sculptor from Lancaster, who came down to help as, as sort of one of the few artists I know who actually has a very keen knowledge of, of archaeology. And when I say that there was an appendix, the appendix really was a very active lecture series. So we had a large number of people lecturing um, at usually about one o'clock every day. Uh, they might be ecologists, they might be um, uh, archaeologists, they might be social historians, they might be people who have a practical relationship with the river, like the river police. Um, they might be art historians. So every day, open to the public also, we had this very extensive lecture series, which I, I believe was really primarily for um, the participants, but of course anyone else could come. And we made a lot of great connections. We also used a lot of these people to bring them into the tents and tell, tell us what the heck we were looking at. This man's in a lot of my slides. I'm sure someone here knows him. absolute drudgery. I mean, I think that, and people often ask, what's the best thing you find? People often ask, what's the oldest thing you find? So we could always say, oh, well, we found a 10,000-year-old, a 10-million-year-old fossil. How's that for you? But, I mean, what, what was remarkable wasn't any particular thing. It was really just the, uh, just the volume of things, really. The how many things we found. We certainly found things going, we, you know, we found Roman, f Roman pottery fragments, um, you know, we found Action Man's boot, we found a lot of different things, and it really was this, um, this kind of collection. What I'm doing this week, actually, is installing all of those works in a very large double-sided cabinet, um, which I think opens to the public at, in the Art Now space of the Tate uh, on Tuesday. And uh, it's a cabinet that sort of looks like this. Uh, it's, uh, and it has drawers that can be opened. There are lots and lots of things. There are cupboards at the bottom that can be opened. It doesn't really look like this. Uh, and um, somehow I'm trying to place as much as I possibly can and contextualize it within this. So one side of the cabinet will be bank side. One side will be mill bank. Oh, one more thing, sorry. I'll go through this really quick. This is the city of Rome. Uh, and in the city of Rome is very beautiful on the hilltop, the Villa Medici, which is the French academy where the uh, very lucky French artists get to spend a lot of time and, um, and uh, do their work in embarrassingly gorgeous studios. And of course it has a very interesting and rich history. Uh, Carolyn Christophe Barkgrave has worked very hard to open the French academy to the public for a series of exhibitions. Uh, the first one happened two years ago and then there was one this summer as well. And I was commissioned to work with um, Bob Brain, who I work with pretty often, uh, to do a project. And we looked at different sites, and everything was just too gorgeous, too perfect, too interesting. So we said, there's got to be something else here that, uh, that, you know, where we could possibly work. And uh, we found out, in fact, there was. Uh, there were a very large series of underground caves and caverns and tunnels. Uh, which have not been really gone into since the 19th century extensively. Um, there are several different levels. There are two aqueduct levels, and then there's a tufo mine, and this is the tufo. Tufo is, is what they used to mix to make mortar in the Roman period. Uh, and they range essentially from 2 BC to, uh, to 100 um, AD, more or less. Uh, so we spent two days down here um, photographing crawling around um, uh, and es essentially exploring. Uh, not, I mean, you have no bearing there. It's intensely dark. So we did it the old-fashioned way. We banged nails and followed the string. We ended up using about three miles of string. These are teeny tiny stalactites because they've only had a millennium to grow. So they're really only like that big. This is in the aqueduct level. There's Bob Brain. There I am. I mean, at some points it really got incredibly claustrophobic and, and tight, and you had to crawl on your hands and knees. And we found that underneath all of that, even underneath the um, Tufo mine level, there was another level, and there's sort of the top of some other building that 
no one really knows what it is and, and I don't think anyone has really described it. For someone who collects things, it was amazingly tempting <laughs> and I had to make a solemn promise not to uh, leave with, um, uh, you know, during, during the periods of the uh, barbarian invasions, people would throw down garbage and all sorts of things to try to block up these uh, tunnel systems that the barbarians were using to invade the inner city. So they are just absolutely filled with um, untouched statuary and pottery and um, chicken bones. And this is how we finally resolved the piece. Uh, we wanted to do a documentary piece. Uh, uh, we wanted, of course, to, uh, uh, to make fun of our own action man-like behavior. And, uh, but if you actually looked at the photographs, there are quite a few um, that we had taken a decade before uh, while we were doing some cave exploring in Mexico. So that whole promise of this is what we saw is somehow frustrated. There I am, of course. Bob. And it's, you know, it's all about the kit, right? Okay, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. If, uh, if there are any burning questions from the audience now, we have uh, five or ten minutes. Okay, you can go. Maybe. No? Oh, yes. Oh. I mean, in, in the end, as sort of maybe corny as it sounds, all, all of my work really does come from a very intense personal interest in these issues. I mean, these are, um, in some way for me, as, a, as um, in the beginning as an artist, I had this kind of schizophrenic existence. You know, I was, I was um, very interested in contemporary theory and philosophy, and I was gaining what I call my toolkit. You know, I was really learning how to deal with ideas conceptually and critically. On the other hand, I would spend my weekends with my other buddies fishing and hiking and doing all these other things. And I r it took a long time for me to figure out how to bring these two things together and to use that um, uh, sort of what I think about and what I hope is a kind of critical methodology and apply it to the things that I really love and care about. And so, I mean, it really does especially projects like uh, this last project that I showed uh, with Bob Brain is really about um, trying to keep myself interested in my, in my activity. I mean, I think it's very hard to be an artist and, and continue to do things without reinventing yourself and without, uh, I have to continually motivate my own passion and interest for what I'm doing. And, and that very often dictates the direction that I take. You know, it has to be really interesting. I have to learn a lot and I have to have an interesting time or uh, it's not worth it. It's the other rewards involved are just not enough to make it worth it, really. One thing I, I was actually interested in was that uh, in the projects where you set up a kind of um, these procedures, how to, how, to, how, to, how to go through with something, and they're, they're sometimes they're quite uh, sophisticated or quite careful, yeah. and deliberate, yeah. and and in in a way it kind of mimics a kind of scientific approach to you know to looking for something. But the, of course, the crucial difference is that with a scientists very often, they would be looking specifically for something. They would have, have an agenda or have a didactic that yeah. they were trying to prove. Or prove or disprove, yeah. Or disprove, yeah. And, and yeah. it occurred to me, uh, have you ever found yourself um, almost being, no, without even intending to, um, becoming dragged into trying to make a point or fi you know, finding that you actually do have an agenda, catching yourself halfway, halfway through and say, oh, actually, I'm beginning to not be as uh, analytical as I, as I thought, and I'm actually looking for certain things and not others. Right. I mean, I, I, I definitely am very prejudiced <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I make one of these projects, and I can't, um, it's very hard for me to be rigorous about following a, a kind of scientific methodology because I find myself saying, oh, that, that looks really nice. <laughs> you know, I, I, the, the sort of aesthetic aspects of it really do um, begin to interfere, and so I have to check myself all the time about that and, and there are definitely projects where I feel like there's room for me to, um, uh, to embellish certain things and then there are projects where I really can't muck around and I, everything has to be done really um, according to the, to the rules. 
was only thinking that really because one of the earlier projects you talked about where you were actually in, in Rio for the, the conference, and right. obviously it's an extremely politicized kind of environment to be in. Yeah. And in some ways, the only way you can survive that kind of experience as an artist doing a project is to somehow um, pull yourself back from having an agenda and right. simply have a, have a procedure. Well, for me, I mean, I really saw that piece as, as being very um, politically um, uh, incisive in some way because the, the, I mean, the language of the Rio Earth Summit, suddenly you developed, there was this new term that um, scientists had used for several years, but really wasn't really a public term like biodiversity. It, it was suddenly a new word was invented in the public and I was really interested in trying to show that when people talk about biodiversity, when pe especially scientists talk about biodiversity, they're really talking about the small things that run the world and talking much less about whales and, uh, and wolves and owls and these things, these kind of charismatic megafauna that often, um, they are part of the debate, but when you talk about biodiversity and you talk about um, the problems in the tropics, what you're really talking about is small things that are going extinct um, and, are, and are very endemic and very small. Do you get pulled into that discourse? Do you find yourself being a spokesperson in that kind of capacity? Um, I, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I think. I mean, I think I want the work to function that way. I mean, I, I really, to me, that's that's really an intention. I, I don't. Um, I don't shy away or make excuses for kind of didactic aspects of the work. I'm very happy with that, and I, and I really try to, um, uh, you know, it's a really important aspect to me. I, I really want this work to function politically. Mm -hmm. I just wonder about the number of projects you have yourself in your right. collection and how, how you see yourself in relation to creating a characterized or caricature and archive of yourself. Right. I suppose that you've got this great legacy for the future, which is you and your glasses and your t-shirts and your <laughs> Thank you, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think that I, I really, I, I think of, of um, I mean, I, I do know when I'm off and when I'm on. I mean, for me, it's really very, very clear. And my, um, I think about that persona that I project as, as material. It really is. And, and I'm very careful about how I construct that. Uh, I, th I think it, it's enormously, it's, it's sort of helped me in ways and it's also something I think you have to be very, very cautious about because it's also something that, um, I mean, the media sort of really wants this image of the artist in some way. And uh, on one hand, I also want to construct this, I'm very interested in sort of crackpot science. I mean, I, I think it's, it's really exciting and, and in some way it's, it's maybe the one area of science that has not been overtaken by, um, uh, you know, by industry, essentially. So I'm very interested in, in flirting with that kind of, that kind of historical discourse around, around that, around um, sort of inventors, uh, nerds, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff is really uh, exciting. But I, th I think about myself and, and my image as, as very much an important part of the material, which also is the, is the part that, that makes it cohesive. You know, it really, uh, it bridges projects. One of the problems of people of my generation as artists is that we, are, we do work in this kind of international forum where you can't expect the audience to follow you. And every project, like I think every, you know, any artist makes work in response to what they've just done. Uh, sometimes if they see flaws in a project, they try to correct them in the next one. You know, if, you, if, if your painting's not doing what you want it to do, you make the next painting. And it, resolve some of those problems. The same is true for, for I think, the artists that, that, like myself and the people who work in my uh, system, but no one is able to see that, because if you're doing a show in Miami, and then your next show is in Helsinki, the next thing is in Milan, who can follow you? Who can follow those jumps? I mean, that, and that's why that persona helps me bridge that in some way, in the same way that publications do. I mean, I, publications are really an important part of what I do. Right.
Right. I mean, I, th I think it's really clear that, um, that the photographs aren't just representing the work in some way. They really are another form of, of work. And I, I think that that's how, they have to, that's how they have to be because that's the life in which most people are going to see your pieces. Uh, and I, th I think about that as, as a not entirely satisfactory situation, but it's a, re it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real problem. It's the real solution. A lot of my work have, uh, you know, these pieces have sound components. You know, that last piece has a sound component of water dripping that we recorded in, in, uh, in the caverns. And so those things never come through, and you can never really discuss them. And there always will be a difference from seeing that thing to seeing, to seeing the photographs. But nevertheless, you can't just ignore the fact that, that this is the way that the work goes out in the world. And you have to, I think, be very pragmatic and very smart about, uh, ab about that. You know, I, I really believe in taking a lot of images and, and making those count. And it's, it's an important way to present your ideas, but it's less than perfect. Yeah. I, sure. And 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 I, I mean I think that there are projects where they really do become about the image. I mean I, I do worked on some public projects and with uh, a curator who was an absolute maniac about getting the photo, and she really hired very very good people, and she knew that that was. Uh, you know where her bread was buttered was not in what actually happened, was but was about how this thing had its life elsewhere. And I actually learned a lot from her um, because of that. I mean, I think that's true. You could you could have a very cynical relationship, but for me, really, the primary experience is to be there. You know, I, I mean, for me, that that's it's really kind of clear. Maybe that wraps it up for this evening. Um, before you go, just a quick reminder that. Um, the week after next, uh, Martin Tweed will be here, uh, and he's bringing his guitar, so I hope you can <laughs> play it along. Um, but for now, I'd just like to thank Mark once again for this evening.